Chapter 71 Baby Steps It had been about two days since Enos had left in search of the fairy that plagued him. I did not move away from my initial spot at the edge of the mountain overlooking the great forest below. I had to admit, I was worried. Was he going to make it? Was going to fail? I truly wanted to help, yet this was his fight, and I had no right to intervene. Sidis and Emmy had long since left for somewhere else, while little Essie was the only one that stayed behind with me waiting. She happily played in the air, as I could see the wind manna merrily surround her almost as if it were her old friend. It tickled her scales and playfully lifted her in the air. I guess I can see why she seldom spends any time on land, I inwardly noted. I was the same way when in water. Everything just feels right as if I was always meant to be there. I didn't spend a lot of time in the giant lake the past few days, but I had a reason for that. First of all, whenever I go there, I never want to leave. Were it not for my mother's disagreement, then I would have already settled in the deep side of the lake. Though according to my mother, I cannot leave home until I pass my rite of passage, which gives rise to another problem. Soul space, I muttered out loud as I recalled the first time I came in contact with one back when I visited Ammonida, and then the second time was when faced with my grandfather's attack. Why this was a problem was due to the fact that I was not considered eligible to apply for my rite of passage until I mastered control over my soul space. Now I wouldn't have particularly minded this rule had I been taught how to summon my soul space, or at least given some sort of guidance. Instead, mother simply told me that I had to figure it out by myself, and that if I didn't could only mean I was still lacking and could not go for my rite of passage just yet. As I sat there overlooking the great forest below, my mind wandered back to how my grandfather activated his soul space. I found myself trying to think of ways to replicate what he did and hopefully be able to use my own in the process. Mana seemed to gather around him like a whirlwind, and then a sea of flames extended outwards and encompassed me within before I knew it I was already inside his soul space. I carefully tried to recall every detail, but to no avail. That's different though, is it not? I mean what I saw was the process of him pulling me into his soul space. I still have no idea how he created it in the first place, I inwardly noted. A frown made its way onto my face as I summoned a small water ball above my palm. The ball quickly changed shape under my careful gaze from its formless one to that of a dragon, then a human, then a wolf, a fish, before it finally reverted to its shapeless form. Is it mana? I wondered and quickly closed my eyes. I took a deep breath, taking in the water mana inside my body, and followed it with my senses. I felt it move in a cycle of sorts filling my body with a pleasant feeling as I could sense it slowly but surely strengthening it in the process. It was a slow but meticulous way of growing stronger when I never paid too much heed to. But this is not it. I don't think this is the answer. I shook my head as my frown deepened. Just what is it? As I was trying to think of another way, I suddenly recalled the strange heart power. Could it be that? I wondered, but even so, I was not sure how I could use it. To my knowledge, the only attacks I saw or was aware of using heart energy were dragon breath, or when father had used it to guide his mana attack before. Still, it's the only thing that would make sense, I mumbled. Confused at the whole ordeal, just how was I supposed to figure it out by myself? Essie had came down and landed on my head at this time. She excitedly grabbed my horns and nudged me forward. Look, Big Brother Enos is back, she said. Surprised, I turned my gaze towards the direction she was motioning to. And sure enough, a weary Enos was making his way back to the mountain. He flying unsteadily and seemed to be on the verge of collapse. I frowned, anticipating the worst, yet as soon as he got closer... I was able to catch a better glimpse at him. Although signs of tiredness were evident on his body, his eyes were proud carrying a hint of excitement and satisfaction. As soon as he landed next to us, my gaze was unconsciously drawn to his palm where a squealing little fairy was struggling against his firm grip. I was momentarily surprised by her figure. The little fairy's hair was a soft green, the color of grass, while her eyes were without a doubt her most distinctive feature. They lacked an iris and were both obsidian black giving her a sinister and ominous feel. Not quite what I was expecting. I inwardly mumbled. The little thing looked more like a demon if anything than a fairy. Her screams were high-pitched, and as she opened her mouth trying to bite Enos's clawed arm, a row of small yet sharp teeth were revealed. Enos seemed to have her in control as he tightened his grip on her body causing her eyes to bulge a little as she quickly stopped struggling. He then turned towards me and lowered his head in respect and gratitude before speaking. Thank you, brother, for your help, he said to which I simply smiled and nodded. Essie appeared to be interested in the little fairy as she hopped off my head and carefully circled Enos while scanning the little creature with interest. 
She's so small, she muttered, to which Enos replied. And annoying. He growled in irritation. What are you going to do with her now? I asked in curiosity. I had honestly thought that the first thing he would do if he caught the little thing would be to kill it. Yet seeing it how he managed to restrain himself and even brought it back. I was impressed he really did mature. I nodded in approval. Huh? Oh, I just wanted to show you that I was not lying. He said while puffing his chest back proudly. Well, it's true that we might have doubted him at first when he kept talking about a fairy this fairy that. But surely, he must have some other plans for it. He didn't bring it all the way back here just to eat. My thought process was interrupted as Enos suddenly crushed the little fairy in his palm causing her head to pop up like a toy. I was speechless at the scene, while he looked satisfied. Little Essie on the other hand was disappointed as she seemed to have wanted to see more of the fairy. I mean, at least he stopped himself from killing it the very second he caught it? Baby steps, right? Chapter 72 Breakthrough The next days were spent without any problems. Enos was finally able to leave the mountain now that the fairy situation had been dealt with. Essie never goes too far away from home, and Emmy spent most of her days basking under the sun, while Sita still had the habit of sneaking off somewhere at night. I, on the other hand, would spend most of my day in the lake and only go back when it's my turn to hunt, or when the sun is setting down. The large lake that I once considered to be too big, felt rather small and restricted. It did not take me too long to cross the whole thing underwater and I already had a general idea of its denizens. Somehow, I found myself yearning for the boundless ocean. There I had felt freer, and much stronger. The quality of water mana was different too, I inwardly mumbled. I was currently sitting on top of the water in the middle of the lake. A sigh escaped my mouth. The thick water mana surrounded me, brushing itself against my scales. As I breathed in, it would flow inside of me like a stream, and then move on to form a circle of sorts before leaving my body. This cycle continued unconsciously, slowly strengthening my body. It was also using this that I was able to heal myself of any injuries I had before. I would simply accelerate the cycle of mana by forming a water bubble around myself. So is mana our main source of power? I often found myself wondering. It certainly seemed that way, especially with all of its uses. It could attack, it could defend, and it could even heal. Then again, I still could not get over the heart power. Something was missing. I don't think I'm using mana nor the hard energy to their full extent. It feels like something is missing, but what? I scratched my head as a low growl of annoyance escaped my mouth. Just what am I overlooking? I let a sigh, forcing myself to calm down before I jumped into the air, the water rippling below me. Let's just go back for today. The sun had yet to set, but I was no longer in the mood. I wanted to go sleep already and forget about this. For now, it felt like I was running empty circles trying to grasp something I don't even understand. As I rose through the air, my eyes were unconsciously drawn back to the large lake below. The scenery was truly beautiful, with the thick forest surrounding it, it was almost mesmerizing. Just then a sudden idea fell on my mind, inspiration if you might. Wait a minute, I didn't try that yet. I hastily stopped in my tracks as I continued to observe the lake below. What if the key was in mana all along and not the hard energy? Looking at the water body below, a sudden thought made its way into my head. What is the mana is like the lake below? So far all it has been doing is complete a cycle inside my body and then leave, but what if it wasn't supposed to leave? I knew I was desperately trying to grasp at any sign of hope, but I felt as if this time, I have finally found my shining beacon. Like an arrow let loose, I swiftly descended back to the water below. My wings were tucked by my side further increasing my speed. Just as I was about to reach the water, I quickly opened them which abruptly halted my descent and instead changed my direction sending me rushing ahead instead. I flapped my wings to slow down and gently touch the water below, not seeking to the bottom but instead standing on top of it like it was hard ground. This place will do, I mumbled out loud, I was standing in the middle of the lake with strong water mana surrounding me. I closed my eyes and reached out to it, I had no problem doing so and easily felt the mana going in and out of my body. Wait, even if I can keep the mana from leaving, where am I supposed to store it? I was quickly faced with another dilemma. Perhaps this is where the heart energy comes into play? I wondered. I slowly guided the mana towards my heart. I was well aware that what I was doing was risky. But still, I had no other choice. It was all or nothing. To my immediate surprise, the mana that was always so obedient to me refused to stay no matter how I willed it to. It even outright ignored me when I tried to order it. What the hell? It simply continued its cycle and harmlessly left my body. A frown made its way onto my face. I quickly tried again only to be met with another failure. 
The mana simply refused to follow my orders, and for the first time, I felt helpless and betrayed. Wait, this just might work. I suddenly recalled my father's breath attack, the one where he had used his heart energy to guide his mana attack. Maybe that's what the heart energy is for? I wondered. I slowly reached out to it and willed to gather and guide the mana towards my heart. To my amazement, it worked. The heart energy worked like a natural guide to the mana, which surprisingly stopped its resistance. Once my water mana slowly began to accumulate around my heart, a change began to appear. My heart energy worked like a bubble that held the mana inside. The bubble continued to expand as more amounts of mana were absorbed in it until it finally reached the size of a small fist and then finally stopped growing. My heart energy then moved as if it had a will of its own. The bubble near my heart began to rapidly shrink in size as a strange yet somewhat familiar aura emitted out of it. I watched over it in curiosity and anticipation as it continued to shrink from the size of a small fist to that of a finger before it finally exploded with a puff, and then everything went dark. I felt disoriented for a few seconds as my eyes slowly blinked open. I felt different, very different. My body did not feel the same. I opened my eyes to a large blue space, one where the sky and ground seemed connected with a gentle blue color. I looked down in surprise only to find out that I had no physical body, I had no form. I was everywhere at the same time. I unconsciously understood what this was. This was my soul space. I had succeeded. A loud cry full of excitement reverberated throughout the entire space causing it to shake. I still did not know the full extent of my powers, but for now, what I did know was that I was invincible in here. My body suddenly materialized in the middle of the space. I brought my claw to my face as I observed it, and then changed its form to my will. My grin widened as I slowly began to understand how the space worked. This is fun. Chapter 73, Consequences My eyes blinked as I found myself still sitting in the middle of the large lake. A frown made its way onto my face as I tried to open my soul space once again only to fail miserably. The mana that I had accumulated had surprisingly been wiped clean, meaning my soul space was broken as well. What the dash? Right as I was about to start gathering more mana to rebuild it. A pain unlike any I have felt before suddenly assaulted me causing me to collapse. It was not a physical one, but it felt like it came directly from my soul. A loud cry unconsciously escaped my mouth causing the water below me to shake. My eyes turned bloodshot as the pain quickly turned unbearable. I lost all my mobility as my body refused to give move an inch under the pain. I was constantly praying for someone, anyone to make it stop, to my immediate horror. A few of my scales even began to fall off further increasing the pain. My mind was blank as I prayed to lose my consciousness, all for it to stop. Yet like a cruel joke, no matter how hard prayed, nothing seemed to change. I remained fully conscious as I felt my insides twist and turn, it felt as if countless sharp knives were stabbed all across my body, with my heart area being the one in the most pain. I was unable to move and simply laid there limply while crying out loud. I did not know for how long my torment continued before a shadow dropped next to me. My gaze was blurry, yet I still managed to make out Essie's anxious figure. She fidgeted around me, panicking as she did not understand what was happening to me. Her eyes darted between my collapsed figure and the direction where our floating mountain was situated at. As if finally making up her mind, Essie swiftly moved from behind me, her paws grabbing me by the horns as she flapped her abnormally large wings and took off with me in tow. I could feel the wind mana surrounding my body as it helped her carry me. Our height and weight differences were very large, yet that did not seem to matter much to her. I was sure the scene of her small figure dragging me by the horns would be considered comical at any other day, yet I had no leisure to think about that. Big brother, just wait a little longer, I'll take you back to mother, and you will be alright. Just wait. I'll definitely save you. Just wait. She constantly repeated that to me, yet it seemed more as if she was saying it to reassure herself instead. My screams thundered through the skies as we made our way back home. The pain did not subside and was still unbearable. I had never felt anything like it before. At that moment, I regretted everything that led me here. I regretted playing with mana. I regretted experimenting with soul space. I regretted even trying in the first place. As soon as we closed in on the mountain, my siblings swiftly appeared by our side. Emmy's usually calm demeanor was broken as an anxious expression plagued her face. Sidis was no better he hastily moved to help support Essie who was holding me. Eno's eyes were wide open in shock and disbelief as he saw my pathetic state. He was unable to move as his mouth hung open. What happened? Anxiously asked Sidis. I don't know. I just heard Big Brother scream and found him like this, answered Essie with a stutter, her paws never quite leaving my horns. 
Let's take him to mother, hastily said Emmy, before she hit Eno's on the head. Snap out of it and help, she said, to which he quickly followed, his eyes still hazy in disbelief. I could feel all of their mana surrounding me as they tried to be as gentle as they could while carrying me. Mother was standing outside of the cave with a serious expression on her face as she watched us land. And mother, something is wrong with big brother. Please save him, cried out, Essie. Sidis who was right behind her lowered his head to mother. Emmy and Enos did the same. Seeing that she was being too rash, Essie hastily lowered her head as well. Mother looked at them, and then back at me before she spoke. Silly child, raise your head, she said, to which Essie gingerly looked up to face mother's gaze. It seems like Ether tried to form his soul space. He also succeeded, albeit his success was short-lived, said mother causing all of my siblings' eyes to widen in surprise as they turned to look at me in shock. Mother had already informed them that should they want to apply for their rite of passage, that they had to obtain and master their soul space first. I already knew that from grandfather, so I wasn't too surprised. If he succeeded, how come he is like this mother? Asked Emmy. While it is true that he managed to form his soul space, this child did not realize his limits and ended up draining it before it had been able to stabilize. What he is experiencing is the consequences of his rash actions, she said with a sigh. Be but mother, you can help him, right? Jumped Essie in a pleading tone. To that, mother shook her as another sigh escaped her mouth. Soul space is a dragon's greatest strength and greatest weakness at the same time. I cannot intervene. The only thing Ether can do is wait it out until it passes. Bring him inside the cave. She added, to which my siblings hastily used their mana to bring me inside and gently set me down in a corner. They all watched over me with worried expressions. Essie was fidgeting as she buried her head under Emmy's wing. Sidis walked towards the deeper part of the cave, his figure seemingly merging with the shadows, yet I can still feel his gaze on me. Enos had a blank expression of disbelief on his face. He simply stood there watching over me. He was surprisingly calm. His usually over-enthusiastic demeanor was nowhere to be found. I, on the other hand, laid limply on the ground. My voice was hoarse from screaming too much. I had no more energy. The pain continued for what seemed to be a few hours. I was never quite able to get used to it. Finally, I slowly began to regain control over my limbs. The pain subsided yet I had no power to move anything. Seemingly sensing that, Essie rapidly rushed to my side and licked my face affectionately. You are okay, big brother. You are okay. She kept repeating that, to which I simply gave a tired forced smile. Mother who was sitting down near the entrance all this time stood up and walked towards me. Her eye seemed to study my body before she nodded. Do you know what you did wrong? She asked, to which I forced myself to shake my head weakly and reply. Sidis moved towards us to hear what she had to say, as all my siblings seemed to pay close attention to her. Mother then proceeded to explain. Your mana ran out, leaving only your inner energy behind which caused your soul space to collapse. Your soul space is akin to a world created within you. To sustain this world, you need to constantly provide it with mana all the while using your inner energy to keep it in check. What you did wrong was being too hasty and making too many changes inside your soul space which consumed all of the mana you had accumulated creating an imbalance. The result of that is as you can see. I weakly nodded in understanding. I wanted to ask mother more questions yet all the tiredness suddenly overtook me as my eyelids felt immensely heavy. Let's just rest. Heavens know I need it. And with that, I finally drifted into the blissful embrace of sleep. Chapter 74 Five Years Later Ever since my first failed attempt at creating a soul space, five years had passed. Along of things had changed in the past years, my body had grown even larger. I was still nowhere near my mother or my grandfather's height, yet I had certainly grown taller, and I wasn't the only one. Sidis and Emmy had grown a lot as well. Both of them still looked like twins with opposite scale colors. Enos got more muscular than ever. His body strength was able to pierce through a damn small plane with ease. Essie, on the other hand, was still the shortest out of all of us. She still very much enjoyed settled down on top of my head, between my horns. Everyone had grown stronger throughout the last few years. Little Essie's control over wind mana was incredible, so much that she was able to move our entire mountain using it. Granted, she only managed to gently nudge it, rather than push it, but that was still a testimony of her strength. Sidis became almost impossible to find during the night. He would use the shadows to his will, wielding them to hide his presence. I had seen him hunt countless oblivious monsters that way, and it still brought shivers down my spine each time I did. He would silently creep behind them, and by the time they noticed, it was already too late. His fighting style was no longer as straightforward as it was when we were just kids. He became much more calculative, 
with a nasty habit of toying with his prey. No matter the difference in strength between them, Sidis always seemed to enjoy making his prey tremble with unease, afraid of where he might pop out next. Truly a nasty habit, I shook my head with a sigh, the water of the lake below jumping about around me as I lay basking under the warm sun. My mind soon wandered back to my siblings and how much they grew. Eno's obsession with training his physical body went beyond the realm of ordinary. He would purposely refrain from using his magic and hunt his prey using his physical strength alone. I had berated him about it when he first began this training but eventually gave up seeing how he seemed to have his mind set on the matter. I did not know how he did it exactly, but every day he would come back home with his body littered with wounds and even missing some scales. He also picked up a nasty habit of hunting down fairies as his favorite pastime and keeping their tiny skulls on his side of the cave. I honestly had no idea where he even found so many, as I never once stumbled upon one in the past five years, while he managed to fill up an entire corner with their skulls, forming a miniature pyramid of sorts. Emmy was the one who did not change much in the last few years. She would still spend most of her days dozing off at the entrance while basking under the sun. The only time she ever moved was when it was her turn to hunt. Speaking of which, another person that never moved was my mother. I didn't know why exactly, but mother spent all of her time sleeping. While Emmy would go for the occasional hunt, mother on the other hand would sleep for months on end. Another strange thing was that I did not get to see our father in the past five years, not even once. I had asked my mother about it once, and she replied by saying something about a task assigned to him by grandfather, where he had to take care of some mission far away. For some reason, the conversation grandfather had with the other adult dragons I overheard all those years back came to my mind. I guess it must have to do something with the adult brown dragon of that time. Another noteworthy thing was that I finally managed to understand the geography of our surroundings and it went as followed. We were born in a giant barren mountain somewhere to the east of our current floating home. If I want to visit our birthplace, I would have to head east until I get out of the forest, there I will find the ancient city, I was strictly forbidden by my mother to go near there, hence that was the borders for the current me. Yet I still remembered the first time we left our birthplace when mother and father brought us to our home. We had passed by a gray mountain range where we met some strange shadowy monster. I had my speculations about those abominations, especially considering how they looked similar to the shades I met on my naming ceremony, though a lot weaker than those. I guess that would make sense why mother is not allowing us to go there. I mumbled in understanding. So east was as followed, forest, ancient city, gray barren mountain range, and then our birthplace. Now directly to our west, in the middle of the dense forest, on the other hand, was the giant lake where I spent most of my time. Further west was the ancient battlefield where I had met Ammonida. I wasn't sure what was down south, as the thick forest seemed to extend endlessly. Turning my head north, however, was the direction of the mountain of beginning, the dragon road, and the king's temple. That was the general idea of our surroundings. An interesting thing to note was the monster populace. The closer we are to our floating mountain, the fewer monsters we encounter, whilst the further we head away from it, the more frequent the monster sightings become, with some especially strong ones near the borders east and south. The thing all of these strong monsters I encountered had in common was that a certain part of their body was obsidian in color, similar to that of the shades, it felt almost as if they were tainted by something. A yawn escaped my mouth as I stood up and stretched my body. I then unruffled my wings and launched myself into the air, lazily making my way back home. Ever since that dreaded day five years ago, I had never once forgotten the excruciating pain I felt when my soul space collapsed. It had taken me months before I regained my courage to try again. I had succeeded in creating another one and even learned my limits, yet unfortunately, it was not long before I messed up again and was left bedridden for another day the pain was more bearable that time. This cycle continued a few times, with me recreating my space and then biting off more than I could chew, causing it to collapse again. But with each failure, I would learn something new, and I'd further understand my limits. And so after five long years, I was finally able to somewhat master my control over my soul space. I was able to reach a balanced state where my mana would constantly feed my soul space, strengthening it every day. I could now easily jump in and out of it, and was even able to use it against some of the weaker monsters. It turns out that an attack with my soul space is in shorts, dragging my opponent's soul towards this space I created, and destroying them completely. The most important thing to note was that my soul had to be stronger than my opponent otherwise if they managed to break free, the backlash from that could quite possibly be fatal according to my mother. Hence why throughout the past years, I took extra care in choosing my opponents and testing my newfound power against them. 
Chapter 75 Lesson Today's meal was my favorite blue scales lizard. It had a very strong taste and seemed to be almost as if it was naturally seasoned. This was one of the few meals I very much looked forward to since it was truly hard to find one. I happily nibbled on a bone, savoring the taste while my eyes did not leave the newcomer who brought this feast after a long absence that lasted five years, my father. He had suddenly come back without any warning, bringing with him a variety of prey he must have hunted along the way. Surprisingly, even mother was eating an abnormally oversized bird-like monster with shining white feathers, while he rested in a corner with a tired expression on his face. After finishing my meal, I used my water magic to clean my bloody claws and face. A yawn escaped my mouth. I was always rather sleepy after a meal, yet I stopped myself from succumbing to the laziness as I turned to face my father. He had suddenly appeared, and now it was as if he never left. Still, I was rather curious regarding his whereabouts in the past years. I had a general guess it must have something to do with my grandfather and that brown dragon, yet I wasn't too clear on the matter. Hence, after I finished eating, I slowly made my way towards him. I lowered my head as a sign of respect before I spoke. Welcome back, father. His tired gaze turned into one of amusement as he nodded in reply before speaking. I see you have grown bigger. Good, good, he said in a pleased tone, to which I simply smiled. I hope I'm not being rude by asking, where have you been all this time, father? I carefully asked while taking extra care to keep a respectful tone. Father didn't seem too concerned and let out a sigh instead. I was assigned a mission by your grandfather, he explained. So it really had something to do with the brown dragon of before. I noted. I was about to ask some more questions when to my surprise father took the initiative to continue. I had to fill in the role of Nao as he went over the borders to let off some steam after what happened, explained father. It seemed as if he was talking to himself rather than to me, yet I didn't mind as I still got to know more about what was happening. Old Nao, that's the old brown dragon I met with grandfather, right? I asked to which father confirmed with a nod. But father, I remember grandfather talking to the other old dragons about the borders and how it was not old Nao's turn there? I asked trying to pry more information from my father. He let out another sigh before replying. Yes, this cycle was supposed to be my turn in the border, yet old Nao didn't take the death of his grandchild very well. I can understand his rage since that child was the fourth generation to fail the naming ceremony, explained father as he shook his head. Oh, so that was what all that generation thing back then was about, I mentally noted as I remembered the old dragons mentioning something about last cycle's tragedy. Does that mean everyone failed last time? I inwardly mumbled, dragons were truly hardcore with all the tests, trials, and whatnot. I laid down with my front paws in front of me and my wings tucked in my back. It was rare for father to be in a talkative mood, so I had to take advantage of the situation to know more about the world. Father, are the borders the part past the Grey Mountain Range to the east? I asked curiously. Sidis and Emmy had somehow joined in and were seated behind me waiting for father's answer. Essie and Enos didn't seem that interested and instead left the cave to do whatever. Father glanced at us one by one before he proceeded to explain. Hey, those might be considered the borders for you little ones he said with a chuckle before raising one finger to the sky and continuing. The borders I am talking about are up there, he said with a grin. I unconsciously gulped as I felt both Emmy and Sid is stiffen behind me. Up there? Does he mean the planet's borders? Father's gin grew even wider as he saw our shocked state and continued. Our mission as dragons is to uphold the balance of the world. Anything that is a threat to the balance must be eliminated, he said, to which I nodded in understanding. In the shade's ether, are a threat to that balance, he added. As so you fight the shades at the borders of the plane? I asked hesitantly, to which he simply nodded with a grin. With this new piece of news, the scale of everything just turned massive. I was aware of the strength that dragons held, or I would like to think I was. Fighting with gods, moving mountains and seas, we were essentially on a higher plane than even the divine themselves. But still, I always imagined it was all grounded within our current plane. I thought that only the king can traverse the dark abyssal space. Turned out I was wrong. Are we constantly fighting against the Shades, father? I asked. We are. Should we fail to stop them, the entire plane would collapse starting by the mana stream, he patiently explained. Then when you said old Nao went to the borders you meant dash. Father interrupted me, not letting me finish as he replied. Yes, old Nao needed to vent his pent-up rage, and what better place to that than the battlefield against the Shades, he explained but that only served to confuse me even further. But aren't the borders enormously vast? How can you protect them by yourself? I asked in confusion. A chuckle escaped father's mouth as he answered. 
You ask a lot of questions, Ether. Hearing that I lowered my head in embarrassment, he didn't seem angry, and so I waited for his answer. Nobody said I am alone. My job was to guard this particular part of the borders for this cycle. It's simply a coincidence that old Nao was close by, he said. I was about to add another thing before he interrupted me. Now, enough about that. I see you have mastered your control over your soul space, he asked with a strange glint in his eyes. I still have a lot to learn, I modestly replied. Do you know what the requirements for applying to the rite of passage are? He asked while squinting his eyes, to which I nodded and answered confidently. To obtain and master control over my soul space. Good. Then let me ask you this ether. Are you ready to undertake your rite of passage and become a full-fledged dragon? He asked in a serious tone, causing me to gulp nervously. I am. Good. Then get some rest for the day for we leave tomorrow, he added before closing his eyes and ignoring me and my siblings. I turned around only to be faced by Sidis and Emmy's shining eyes. Brother, what are these shades you and father talked about? Asked Sidis, unable to hide his curiosity. And the rite of passage, do you already know what it's going to be? Jumped in Emmy. Well about that. Chapter 76, The Rite of Passage That night, I went to sleep earlier than usual after I'd barely managed to shake off Emmy and Sidis who kept bombarding me with their questions. The next morning, I found myself standing in front of my father at the entrance of the cave. All of my siblings were there as well alongside my mother who came to see us off. You little ones need to hurry and catch up, else you'll be left chasing behind the back of your older brother, said father as he turned to glance at my siblings. His words seemed to affect Sidis the most as I could see him gritting his teeth as he turned to look at me. Oh boy, here we go again. Saying that father turned towards me and asked, I take it you are ready to go? He asked to which quickly nodded in confirmation. Yes, I added. Good, then do your best to follow, and don't lag too far behind, he said. So unlike the naming ceremony, this time I'll be flying by myself, not that I particularly mind. I inwardly noted before turning my attention towards my mother who was standing by the entrance, watching over me. I lowered my head in respect and spoke, Mother, I will be leaving. At that, she gave a nod of approval before answering. I bid you good luck, my child, and I pray to the king for your triumphant return, said Mother in a surprisingly soft and gentle tone causing me to deepen my bow. I then turned towards my siblings. No goodbye was needed between me and Sidis. As soon as our eyes met I, and he already understood everything. Emmy came closer alongside Essie. She rubbed her head against my side, while Essie affectionately licked my face, both wishing me good luck. I will be waiting for you, big brother. Good luck, brother. I thanked them with a smile before my gaze fell on Enos. He was standing next to Mother with his head raised high and his back straight before he let out a roar. My smile widened as I recalled him sending me off the same way during my naming ceremony, and so I simply nodded at him before turning towards Father. Father only looked at Mother once and spoke, I'm off, to which she nodded, and then turned back towards the cave. He then flapped his large wings causing dust and rocks to fly off as he quickly took off into the sky, his large body rapidly moving in the distance. I didn't dare delay any longer as I quickly summoned a water pillar to promptly launch me into the air following after my father. Our difference in size was very clear as I struggled to keep up with him. Father didn't seem like he was even trying, quite the opposite. He appeared to intentionally lower his speed so I wouldn't fall behind. Our destination was the north. The flight proceeded in silence as I didn't have the energy to ask any questions since I struggled to keep up with what I thought was a fast pace. Shockingly, it took us an entire day before we finally left the forest and managed to reach the familiar dragon road within the first rays of the new day. This just went to prove the large gap that existed between me and my grandfather. The last time he took me here, we had arrived in a matter of what seemed like mere minutes, an hour at best, yet for me, it took an entire day. I was sure that father could have arrived way earlier had he not intentionally lowered his speed. I still have a long way to go. I shook my head with a sigh. Our flight over the dragon road continued until what I assumed was halfway before father suddenly dropped to the ground below. I quickly followed after him. From then on, we walked instead of flying. I remembered grandfather saying something about how I should walk the next time I visit the dragon road by myself instead of flying. Interesting. When I was with him we flew all the way to the temple, yet now with father, we dropped halfway. Is it due to the strength of an individual or is it because of one's social standing? I wasn't very sure about that since I was still unfamiliar with the rules of the dragon society, hence I could only assume. We continued on our way. This time since we were on foot I was able to observe the statues better than before. The one thing I noted was that they truly were too lifelike. 
Had it not been for the obsidian color of the statues, I would have without a doubt had a hard time figuring out if they were real or not. Another thing I could feel now that I didn't feel back in my last visit was the pressure. It wasn't as heavy as standing against grandfather or father's bloodlust, yet it was still undeniably there. A strong and steady type of pressure, one that made me feel a sense of respect towards all of these figures that I had never met before in my life. We continued our walk, and along the way, my father would occasionally stop in front of a few sculptures seemingly reminiscing about some memories. Friends maybe? Comrades? Grandfather did mention that most of these honorable ones fell during the Great War. I wonder was this Great War the one that decorated that large door inside the temple? And did Father participate in it as well? I still had a mountain of questions I wanted to ask, yet now did not seem like a proper time for that. So I refrained from doing so and silently followed after Father instead. With most of my attention on the countless sculptures that decorated the road, we quickly arrived at the entrance of the large temple. Father took the lead with me closely behind him. The familiar yet intimidating sculpture of the king greeted us as we both lowered our heads in respect. This time, I did not do anything stupid and didn't raise my head to stare at it. Instead, I silently followed after my father. We did not follow the same route I used when I came here with my grandfather. This time, we went through a relatively smaller corridor that opened into a large but completely desolate room. I was curious, yet I controlled myself and simply followed after my father patiently moving into TH center of the empty room. I raised my head. The ceiling was a dome-shaped one with the drawing of a dark blue river flowing from one side to another. Strange. As soon as we were standing in the center, Father suddenly unleashed his mana as a towering pillar of flames rose to the ceiling. My eyes widened in surprise as I watched his flames come in contact with the drawing. Strangely, the river seemed to ripple sucking in the flames as familiar mana, one I hadn't felt in these past five years, descended upon us. Cosmic Mana Chapter 77 The Goal the painting of the river rippled as it absorbed Father's flames. This continued for a while as cosmic mana descended upon us. This presence feels like that of the king. I inwardly noted, remembering my time back in my naming ceremony. Father had his eyes closed in concentration. The cosmic mana slowly began to surround him, causing a faint dark blue hue to appear. I tried to reach out to it, yet to my disappointment, the mana ignored me completely. I was able to sense a presence guiding it, hence with my non-existing control over it, I was unable to form a connection with the mana. So it's the king that's wielding the mana? I wondered as I watched over the entire ordeal with undisguised curiosity. After what seemed like a few minutes, the mana suddenly moved towards me. I didn't feel any sense of danger from it, so I remained put while waiting to see what would happen. The cosmic mana slowly flowed inside my body and moved straight towards my soul space. Seeing that I panicked, Grandfather had said that soul space is a dragon's greatest strength, but also his greatest weakness. And with the pain of mind collapsing before still fresh on my mind, I was not willing to take any risks. Father must have sensed my anxiety as he spoke in a reassuring tone. Fear not, Ether. Accept the king's blessing, he said causing me to pause momentarily. Despite my nervousness, I forcefully refrained from doing anything rash as I followed after the mana. Once inside my soul space, the previous desolate blue world shook as the cosmo mana began to gather right in the middle, forming a sculpture of a dragon or at least what should be a dragon. The sculpture was unfinished with only the lower part created while the rest was missing. I was confused as I saw that. At first my guess was that the statue was that of the king himself, yet taking a closer look at it, it strangely seemed to resemble me more than anything. Although only the lower part was created, I was pretty confident that it depicted me and not anyone else. With a frown, my eyes blinked back to reality as I turned my gaze towards my father and asked, May I ask what is the meaning of this father? I asked while trying to sound respectful to which he answered with a nod. That is the blessing bestowed upon you by King. It helps you strengthen your soul space, and in rare cases where one has a second affinity, yours, in particular, is an extremely rare one, an affinity with one of the pillars of existence. The blessing will help you create a bond with the mana, that you will have to succeed in your rite of passage to get the entirety of it, for as it is now still incomplete, explained Father to which I nodded with a serious expression. The rite of passage, what sort of trial is it, father? I nervously asked. Did the king inform you of it? Added. A hearty laugh escaped father's mouth as he looked at me with an amused expression. The king? Ha ha. Who do you think you are, little one? The king cannot be bothered by simple matters such as these. He is busy with more serious ones. We only came here to get his blessing before we depart, he said with a grin. Eh? 
Then does that mean the one that will pick my trial is not allowing me to continue? Father interrupted. That's right. The one to pick your rite of passage is me. He confirmed with an ominous grin causing a shiver to run down my spine. Then, if I may ask father, my rite of passage, what is it? I nervously inquired to which father's grin further widened. That would be to destroy the puny land the humans call the Pia Kingdom. He said causing my eyes to widen in shock. T to destroy a kingdom? I muttered. What's wrong, Ether? It's nothing but a bunch of lower life forms. They brought this upon themselves, he said with a frown. I was not bothered by the fact that my mission was to exterminate an entire kingdom for humans. My conscience was clear. To me that was a dragon. They were the enemy. Though I would be lying if I said I had no concerns. During my last fight against them, the humans were unexpectedly weak. Though they did hold some interesting abilities, I could not ignore the fact that I held the absolute advantage at sea. Perhaps things might get trickier at land. Maybe I would even find some strong opponents. Yes, father. I nodded in confirmation to which my father seemed pleased as he continued to explain. Listen well, Ether. Currently the humans are the ones ruling over the lower continent. They divided the land into six countries. The Pia Kingdom, which is located at the south. The Tineda and Rhymer Kingdoms directly above it. The Yadur. And Lumia Empires to the north, with the Zazel Dynasty to the east. Though we do not meddle with the affairs of the lower continent, we are nonetheless aware of everything that goes on. The Pia Kingdom had been sending their men in search of our land for years now, and although by pure luck, they did manage to kill our younglings years ago, he said as his frown deepened. I gulped facing my father's piercing gaze, a dangerous aura was surrounding him as he spoke. Remember well, Ether. A dragon never forgets. The humans have grown arrogant with our disappearance. It's time they learn that their actions have consequences. Your rite of passage trial is to teach them a lesson. Make sure the Pia Kingdom is gone from the face of this plane. Ordered father as his bloodlust skyrocked. With my back drenched in cold sweat, I raised my head high and replied. Yes, father. He seemed pleased with my answer as he nodded and continued. Good. Then let us move. I will guide you to your destination. How you take care of the humans will be up to you. He said and then lowered his tail in front of me. I hastily jumped on top of it and swiftly moved to stand on his head. Father then steadily made his way out of the temple, passing by the king's statue once again, as we both gave our respects. Once outside, Father nimbly jumped to the sky and made his way further north towards what I assumed to be the edge of our continent. Our flight proceeded smoothly with no problems, the large grassland disappeared as we left the temple and dragon road behind, only to be replaced by the familiar sight of a dense forest. We continued on our way for almost a day before we reached the edge. The sea appeared before my eye, extending towards the horizon. Father did not stop as we swiftly flew past the land, the scenery below changing from a dense forest into an endless sea. Turning my attention back, I was surprised by the sight of the continent from this side. It appeared as if it had been cut cleanly off by something or someone. Chapter 78 Extermination The flight continued uneventfully for two full days. Father didn't even stop to rest. By the dawn of the third day, land was finally at sight. We were high in the air, far above the clouds as we approached what looked like a small fishing village. I could see a few boats close by the shore with some humans in them. Father came to a stop, as he glanced at the peaceful village below and spoke. This is your first target. Use whatever methods you want and exterminate them. He said in a chilly tone. I gulped and nodded in acknowledgement, before hopping off his head. Now, since it's a seaside village, I suppose the fastest way to handle this is that. I thought as I turned to attention to the sea. Just as I was about to start, my gaze was unconsciously drawn to a group of young children playing on the beach and throwing sand at each other. A frown made its way onto my face. A small part inside of me argued that this was wrong, that these people were innocent. Yet for some reason, I had no empathy towards them. It was truly as if I was looking at mere bugs. We were not on the same level in the first place. I knew for a fact that had this been in the past, I would have without a doubt been repulsed by the idea of killing humans, even children, but now I no longer felt any way towards them. They were simply there, and I could care less. Was thinking this way wrong? Perhaps, did I care? No. I came here for a mission, and I was going to finish it. I shook my head, ridding myself of all useless thoughts before I descended towards the village. They were soon going to meet their maker, the least I could do is show them who is responsible. This was my way of trying to show respect though they don't deserve it, it was still undeniable that they were innocent. I lowered my altitude. My large figure emerged from the sea of clouds. 
The children immediately spotted me and began to jump in excitement while pointing at me in wonder. A few adults raised their heads in curiosity and surprise. Look, what is that? Oh, old Jan, you also came out. Yes, I just heard the commotion. What's going on? I don't know. Some sort of giant bird appeared? A bird? It doesn't seem to have any feathers, though. Whoa, mother, look how big it is. Nathan, go back inside the house with your little sister. I have a bad feeling about this. But mom, I want to watch the giant bird. Just listen to what your mother is telling you, stupid boy. Various conversations reached my ears as I circled around the small village. The people did not seem to recognize my figure as that of a dragon. Did they never hear about a dragon before? I wondered as I glanced at the small crowd of people that began to gather at the center of the village while pointing at me in curiosity. They didn't appear to be afraid, just curious. It seems like the humans have been living in peace. I only sense a few people who seem a little bit uneasy. Other than that, I'm only sensing curiosity using out of them. Interesting. There are no guards or any people like that for that matter. Is it because it's a small village? I quickly shook my head. I was getting sidetracked again. Taking a deep breath, I came to a stop right above the center of the village and glanced down at the people below. I did not know why, but the way they were all studying me and pointing their fingers at me irked me. I don't like it. A frown made its way onto my face. I quickly unleashed my bloodlust letting it soar through the sky. The humans did not understand what happened as one second I looked completely harmless. The next I was a demon that crawled out of the abyss. Almost all of them fell to the ground in shock and fear. The young ones and elderly passed out immediately leaving a few able-bodied people on their knees. Neil. I spoke in a harsh tone, my voice coming off like a clap of thunder in their ears as I fully unleashed my pressure on the small village. The few small boats that were on the sea were crushed, their owners already met their demise in the water, being the first casualties. I didn't add anything and simply reached out to the waterman as the sea heeded my call. The water began to churn violently as large waves crashed on the shore. The humans had their heads planted in the ground. They were unable to raise their gazes to see what was happening. The few that were still conscious shook uncontrollably under the pressure. I could feel their emotions, the fear that overwhelmed them alongside the confusion over what was going on. Sadly for them, I had no intentions of explaining myself. I unleashed a roar that terrified the humans. The ground shook beneath their feet as the water receded unusually far, exposing the seafloor. An abnormally large wave rose to cast a shadow on the small village below. They did not know what was happening before it was too late. The wave crashed against the fisherman's village, completely erasing it from existence. I watched the entire ordeal with a calm gaze as the water washed the humans away. I heard their screams of pain and agony. I heard their prayers as they pleaded to their gods for salvation, one that was never bound to come. And just like that, the village was gone. The small houses, the people, the children, the elderly, all gone in the blink of an eye. They really are too fragile, I inwardly mumbled while shaking my head with a sigh. With my first mission completed, I turned back towards the cloud and flew to my father who was waiting for me. Good, but next time make it faster, he said, to which I nodded in acknowledgement. Yes, father. And, let's go, you will first clear out all the seaside villages by the end of today before we delve deeper towards their main cities. He explained before flapping his wings and moving towards our next target, with me following in tow. What transpired after could only be described by one word, a massacre. None of the villages we visited stood any chance. They were simply akin to chickens in the slaughterhouse. They had no guards, no nothing, just a bunch of helpless villagers. I did not enjoy slaughtering weak opponents, ones that had no chance of fighting back whatsoever. It's all for the sake of my rite of passage. I reminded myself as we made our way towards another target. Chapter 79 Andala Taking care of the seaside villages was easy, though I did not enjoy the process. It had to be done according to my father. And so, the only thing I could do was follow his orders. My father had explained that this was the only way humans would learn and that we had to set an example. Unlucky for the Pyat Kingdom, that example happened to be them. Now that we had already taken care of the small targets, it was time to move for the big ones. And by that, I mean their main cities. The Paya Kingdom was not a particularly big nor strong kingdom. According to my father, it could only pass as average. The reason this average kingdom could survive is due to its advantageous geographical location. The kingdom had the sea behind it and a giant mountain range standing in front of it, acting as a natural barrier that repelled the Tenada and Rhymer kingdoms from turning their fangs against it. Still, I was confused. If the land is a no-go, why not try to go by sea? 
And so I asked my father, to which the answer was surprisingly simple. First was the fact that no kingdom was very advanced when it came to their navy. The second point was the sea monsters. Hence with these two factors, the Paya kingdom was able to enjoy the peace that was otherwise lacking for the other countries. I was quite surprised by how much my father seemed to know about the human continent. He was aware of the situation in all the kingdoms, and empires, their alliances, their wars. Hell, he even told me about some of the royal families. When I asked him how did we manage to gather so much information when we seldom interact with the lower continent, he simply smirked and said that we dragons know everything. And I had to admit, he looked pretty dang cool saying it. It was my second day on the lower continent, and we were currently making our way towards Andala, one of Paya's three major cities. According to my father, Andala was the country's major tourist city. Luckily for me and unluckily for them, Andala was a hanging city situated on top of a giant waterfall between four mountains. Its natural beauty attracted visitors from countries all across the realm. This meant that this was the perfect place to make a certain announcement. This time, my mission was no to just destroy everything. No, according to my father, I had to let everyone know the price to be paid for messing with the dragons. The flight towards Andala was uneventful. The lower continent was truly a peaceful one. At least from my point of view, it was. We didn't encounter any monsters along the way. No abominations whatsoever. Our flight continued unhindered until we reached Andala. My eyes widened in surprise as the city appeared before my eyes. It was truly beautiful, yet it reminded me of the hanging arena back at the king's temple. Andala was situated on top of a platform in between the four mountains. From each mountain extended a giant thick chain, which helped keep the platform steady. A faint metallic-colored shield surrounded the city. A frown made its way onto my face as I could see the disturbed flow of mana. Are they using magic to help keep the city in the sky? I asked my father in curiosity. The chains alone should not assure the stability of the hanging city, and with the amount of mana that surrounded it, I could somewhat guess what they were using. Father nodded in confirmation. Yes, the stream in this area is almost broken. He sighed and shook his head in annoyance. Go, get it done, and be quick about it. And remember to leave a few survivors, he said, ushering me with his head. Yes, father. I replied enthusiastically and dived headfirst towards the city below. My large figure broke through the clouds as I unleashed a roar, causing a commotion to break out in the city. I circled it with my aura at full blast, yet the humans below did not seem as affected as the villagers. Looks like that shield is not just for show, I noted. Good, hopefully, this will be more fun than the previous ones, I inwardly mumbled as I could feel my mouth curving upwards in anticipation. A quick glance at the city was enough for me to spot the guards that were hastily mobilizing. My name is Lana. I'm an explorer from the Rhymer Kingdom. Rumors of dragons appearing in the city and destroying a small fleet of knights at the coast of the Paya Kingdom brought me here. This was the first rumored sighting of dragons in years, and I was not going to let the chance of studying a mythical dragon escape my hands. And so, I left my home country and made my way towards Paya in my search for dragons. Sadly, Throughout my five years here, I have never had the chance of encountering any. I had even used all my savings and rented a ship to regularly go out into the sea in hopes of finding a dragon but to no avail. And so, with an empty pocket and broken spirit, I was finally ready to set on my journey back home. I stopped by Andala as it was on the way where I was hoping to catch one of their flying ashvings back to the capital. I was walking through the busy streets with a downcast gaze, cursing my luck. I can't believe I just wasted five years and not a single sign of a dragon. I spat on the ground in annoyance as I adjusted the large bag on my back. A sigh escaped my mouth as I reached the Ashfing station. The oversized one-eyed birds always creeped me out. I usually tend to avoid using them, yet now with news of the war between Rhymer and the Yadur Empire intensifying, I had to go back as fast as I could. I was about to approach one of the owners when the city shield suddenly glowed brightly. An extremely heavy pressure descended on the city as a roar echoed from behind the clouds. I could feel my heart threatening to jump from my chest as I unconsciously turned my gaze towards the sky. And there it was, a beautiful majestic blue dragon circling the city. An aura of strength surrounded it causing my eyes to widen and my jaw to drop. W.Y. I unconsciously muttered. I had traveled everywhere in search of a dragon, only to find nothing. Yet now that I was finally ready to leave, one suddenly appears before my eyes. Is this faith? I mumbled as a huge smile made its way to my face. I could see the people panicking as the guards hurriedly mobilized. The mana fluctuated as I was even able to sense the famed mages appear in the city skies. 
yet I could care less. My eyes were glued to the blue dragon that leisurely flew across the sky. How beautiful! Chapter 80 The Fall of Andala I continued circling the city, my eyes scanning the guards below. My attention was drawn by a few robed figures that were standing in the air above the buildings. Just looking at them gave me a nasty feeling, as I could sense the disturbance of the mana surrounding them. They all had haughty expressions on their faces, yet I could feel that deep down, they were frightened out of their wits. The only reason they were able to stare at me with their fake courage was the shield that gave them a sense of safety and security. The guards that looked akin to knights rode what appeared to be one-eyed oversized birds. They circled the robed figures while brandishing their weapons, ready to defend their city should make any move. The crowd of people below was split into two sides. One were those that were scared and panicking. They ran back to their homes for cover while peeking out of their windows. The second side were those that were watching the whole scene in curiosity and surprise. It seems like they still don't quite realize the severity of their situation, I inwardly mumbled, before coming to a stop right above the city. The guards and what I assumed were the mages did not make any hasty moves as they fearfully kept their eyes on me. Well, let's just get this over with, closing my eyes, I reached out to the water mana. Almost immediately a water pillar rose like a sharp arrow from the river below towards one of the giant chains that held the city afloat. The mages had no time to react before the chain broke under the sheer pressure of my attack. Andala shook and began to sway as the abnormally large chain fell towards the waterfalls below. A few buildings tumbled over injuring and perhaps killing some people, yet I was barely getting started. Surprisingly, the mages reacted rather fast as they shot towards the side where the chain was broken. I could sense the mana bend under their will as they forced it to help them stabilize the city. The mages glowed brightly as they used their magic to balance Andala while a few of them shot a few attacks my way. The attacks passed through the city shield harmlessly and lunged towards me. I could have easily dodged them, had I wanted to, yet I didn't. I was curious to see if the attacks had any impact, and so I let the mana balls hit me straight in the chest causing a small explosion to follow, as a dust cloud hindered my vision of the city. I could hear the humans cheer loudly, thinking they got me. A frown made its way into my face, aren't they underestimating me, a bit too much? I grumbled. Their attacks did not even leave a scratch on my scales. I flapped my wings breaking through the dust cloud. The mages' faces were terrified as I suddenly appeared. The citizens that were celebrating moments ago turned silent as I lunged towards another giant chain. This time I did not use my magic and simply rammed against it with pure body strength. A loud bang followed right after as the large chain broke, causing the already unstabilized city to wobble even harder. The mages glowed brighter as they did their best to try to keep Andala afloat, yet it was only a matter of time before it went down. It was quite obvious that with both chains gone, it took them everything in their power to keep the city steady, and even so I could see most of the buildings shake on the verge of collapse. The guards that were surrounding the mages all this time finally made their move. It was now clear that they could not stay on the defensive if they wanted a chance to survive this. A middle-aged lady with short hair and large claymore rushed towards me on riding her oversized bird, the group of guards following closely behind her. So she's their leader, I noted. Her sword glowed with a faint golden light, causing me to feel a small sense of danger from it. Hmm, interesting. It's similar to the sword those other knights used to cut ember back in our naming ceremony. But so what? The most it could do is cut one scale or two, and that's if she can get closer in the first place. I grinned as the small army flew towards me. They even had archers in the back who attacked first, yet their flimsy arrows easily bounced off my scales. Their leader gracefully rode her bird, arriving almost instantly before me. To my surprise, she stood up and leaped with her giant claymore at hand, slashing towards my face. Her attack was swift and decisive, yet unfortunately for her, it was still too slow in my eyes. I easily dodged the captain and rushed towards her soldiers. I wanted to save her for last. Once her attack failed, her bird immediately flew under her quickly catching her falling figure. She let out an enraged roar as she turned her gaze only to see me decapitating her men. I didn't even have to use magic. I simply danced between them using my claws and jaw to cut limbs and tear of heads. The sky above Andala quickly turning into a mist of red as the bodies of the guards alongside their oversized birds began to fall from the air and into the waterfall below. The captain hastily rushed towards me, trying to stop me from killing her men, yet I easily dodged once again and proceeded to exterminate them before her eyes. I could see the rage in her eyes as she kept screaming while trying to catch me. I shook my head in disappointment at her pathetic sight. She should have not rushed headfirst. 
Perhaps this was a good strategy if their opponent were other humans, but as a dragon, their formations were useless in front of me. It did not take long before the small army was no more. I could hear the screams full of panic from the citizens below as they rushed to evacuate. A few similar large birds flew away from Andala carrying their passengers. I simply looked at them go and did not move to stop them. My goal now was to spread fear amongst them, so it was all right if a few of them escaped. Why? My attention was caught by the screaming captain as she glared daggers at me, her claymore shaking in her hands from rage. I harumphed and replied with a deep voice causing her eyes to widen in shock. She must have not thought that I could understand her and that I could talk. You humans have crossed the line. We dragons never forget. I said, my voice booming through the sky into the ears of all those present. The captain seemed confused as she opened her mouth and closed it a few times before she asked, See cross the line? What did we ever do to you? She screamed, her voice full of anger and resentment. You have killed two of our own, and so I came to repay you. Die and atone for your sins, for you dared bear your fangs against us. I growled. Father had said that I was to spread a message, and so the seed of fear threw out the ranks of the humans. The fact that they have killed two of our own was not wrong. Two younglings, one green, and one red had lost their lives in the naming ceremony a long time ago, and the humans never paid for that. Well, father did say a dragon never forget, so I guess I can use this, I mentally noted. 